I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you about our strike in 1987 because it was the first one that I actually had a chance to lead in our local. And um, I, have, um, I have a lot of fond memories from that. Leading up to that um, strike, uh, our members had been told that they weren't allowed, that there was a bylaw in the, or there was a provision in the National Parks Act that said that there were no picketing allowed in a national park. And our members believed this. And so I checked that out and, and basically my national director at the time said, um, well, if there is, I guess you're just going to have to violate it, aren't you? And I went, okay, sounds reasonable to me. <laughs> that's fine. But of course there was no provision. But that's what the authorities had told workers that, oh, no, this is a national park. It's, you, you can't have a picket line set up here. And just because there hadn't been one didn't mean that you couldn't have one. So we decided we were going to have one. And the 1987 strike um, involved um, a series of rotating strikes uh, at first until we were basically either locked out or went out on full strike. Depends on who you talk to. But... Um, uh, we were getting the call. Every day we were ready for the call and and uh, while we were preparing and different locals were going out and everybody was on strike alert, it was really exciting for our members because, you know, they'd, they'd been involved in strikes where they just went home and for the duration and then they got called back when it was over with. But this time they were actually going to participate. And this time they'd actually been leading up with some, you know, information. They'd been participating in demonstrations that uh, I'd organized in the year leading up to it. So they felt a lot stronger and a lot more confident uh, about, you know, down tools and out we go. And uh, so when we did get the uh, call to go out, it was in the middle of the day. And uh, so I ensured that everything was locked up and all of our members went out and we started picketing. And um, we had had, at that point in time, a, a developed a pretty good relationship with our community and they knew what our issues were and that it's not just about money, it's about, you know, creating decent jobs in the community and it's about making sure that the public post office remains a public post office and is protected from the damages and dangers of privatization and they were aware of all those things so we had pretty good support. And um, <laughs> I remember that uh, the RCMP immediately came in as soon as we set up a picket line. They were called right away by a panicky postmaster. And, uh, you know, basically um, were going to tell us, you know, where we could walk and where we couldn't walk. And uh, I remember the uh, sergeant who um, told me to come down the alley with him. And, of course, I wasn't going anywhere with him. <laughs> so I brought the whole, the whole picket line with me. And he didn't like that very much because I wasn't being obedient. And um, it wasn't my job to be obedient, quite frankly. And um, so as he was telling me that I would be arrested if I stepped one foot on post office property. And, you know, I started talking to him about, in a very calm manner, about the fact that I'm a resident of Banff. I'm allowed to walk anywhere within the community. Show me the provisions that tell me that as a citizen of this town that I'm not allowed to step foot on certain property. Show me. Well, he didn't like that either because I was challenging him. And he told me that he had just come from the gainer strike and he knew how to deal with troublemakers like me. And I thought, oh, boy, I'm going to get arrested. <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> and so I said, well, then you're going to have to deal with troublemakers like me because they're, the ones behind me are going to follow in my footsteps. Well, while all this was going on, there was this sweet little old lady who lived in, in uh, Banff. Her name was Doris Gammon. Wonderful, uh, old, oh, she had a history, uh, an amazing history in the town. And she heard this. She had come to witness what was going on. It was drawing a little bit of a crowd. And she started pointing her finger at that cop and saying, you leave that nice lady alone. She's not doing anything wrong. And she's just like... It was so amazing. I felt I'm being defended <laughs> by one of the townspeople. This is so great. And she intimidated that, that cop. Like he had to back off because all of a sudden he realized he wasn't just having a one-on-one -on -one with me and that I wasn't being intimidated by, even though like my guts were rolling and I was going, oh, <laughs> oh here we go. <laughs> but I wasn't going to let him know that I was nervous. And this little old lady, she had to be about 80 years old at that time. You know, how was he going to deal with her? She wasn't going to be intimidated by him either. And so he backed off. And of course, I mean, he was just trying to intimidate us. And it didn't work. And I remember my mom was on the picket line with us that day. And, and uh, one of the women, uh, one of my, my sisters at the post office had brought her kids out on the picket line that day. And we blew up a bunch of pink balloons. 
and uh, tied them to the antenna of all the taxi cabs in, in the uh, town that said subs are substandard. And basically one of our struggles was to stop the, the franchising out of wicket services in the post office to sub post offices in the back of drug stores, in the back of you know, grocery stores, wherever they were appearing at that point in time. And so the taxi drivers all wanted to show support. So all these cabs were driving around with these pink balloons hanging off the antenna, and that was wonderful.